Good morning, my name is Aaron, and I am excited to be here. We're going to continue in our stream series, Many Expressions, One Faith. Brian began a few weeks ago with an overview of the idea that within the Christian faith, there are many streams and many movements. And then he moved on the next week to talk about the contemplative movement, a life of prayer. Last week, Gene kicked us off also with uh, the Messianic movement and how the streams flow together from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And today I have the privilege or have drawn the straw to share with you the charismatic stream. So if you will put on a helmet, some knee pads, leave your biases at the door, we're going to go on an adventure today. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, you are here, and I'm grateful. I ask that you will lead this time, and that you will move in power however you want. We come today, Lord, with a sense of expectancy and a sense of surrender. May your kingdom come and your will be done. What's of me forgotten, what's of you remembered. In Jesus' name, amen. About two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go down to Colorado Springs with my dad. My parents are here today. Darren Shurl, good to see you. And uh, we went down to Colorado Springs. My dad was doing an event at New Life Church on people of the presence, uh, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But the highlight of the time is a tradition that has become sacred for the mortal men. And that is every time my dad's in Colorado, we head up past Woodland Park, past Divide, Colorado, to 11 Mile Canyon. And at 11 Mile Canyon, there is a South Platte. Now, if you were at last service, I referred to it as the South Pratt. That is a street in Longmont. <laughs> but there is a river in Colorado that weaves through, that breaks from the 11 Mile Canyon Reservoir. The South Platte runs into Charles Lake, and it's an incredible stream, and we have gone river, and we have gone there literally for almost 30 years. And we've gone to these waters, and it's taken on mythological portions about the fish that has been caught there. And as we go, one of the things about this section of water is it is a dynamic stream or river. It's not the same all the way through. When it breaks out of the reservoir, it comes rushing out and roaring down the mountain with white water cascading through the rocks. And it goes to some places where it's really narrow. And then it opens up to some other places where there are deep pools and slow water. I like to fish in deep pools and slow waters. <laughs> As you go and you look at the 11 Mile Canyon, one of the things that you'll see that this is full of life. You know, as you walk down these paths, you'll see sign of animals that have been drinking from the stream. You see evidence that there have been people going to this place for a long time. And the stream is filled with fish, and there is birds in the air, and there's wildlife all, all along, and people come here for a respite to experience the stream. Along with the full of life is, there are these well-worn paths. You drive down this road that has all these rivets in it, and so, so you can't go too fast. Uncle Pete, who's a lifelong friend, says the faster you drive, the less they vibrate. So we come flying down there, and we pull off in these places, and then you see all along the canyon, at various levels, there are these well-worn paths where men and women for decades have traversed down the steep terrain, and they make their way to the water's edge. And you can see the footprints, and you can see evidence that people have been here before. And you usually can tell the good places because there's a pile of string that is left. And there's some split shot, and there's some maybe a broken bobber, and there's some debris that is left. And that's not garbage, that's sign. So for an angler, I'm not an angler, I'm a tangler. So good fishermen are called anglers, I'm a professional tangler. And they go down these well-worn paths, and you go to the place, and you can tell the spots where there are the most fish because there's the most sign that people have been there before. And so this stream is dynamic. It is full of life. There are well-worn paths, but one of the things about 11 Mile Canyon, it, it is tricky terrain. It's not like Ohio fishing 
where you pull up to a lake with your lawn chair and a cooler and a fishing pole, and you throw it in and you just wait. This is like full contact fishing. My dad always brings two or three extra poles because in our 30 year experience, there is a mound of casualties of fishing poles. You'll see someone come up shaking their head and once again, they've fallen and broken the rod. And so all the time, we are breaking rods. You go down and you're moving around and it's just a matter of when, not if, your boots are gonna get soaked because you're gonna misjudge a rock and you're gonna find yourself knee deep in the South Platte River. <laughs> also, you go there, and this is the thing that I'm a professional at. Because the stream is moving fast, and because there's debris, it is going to be a place where you inevitably are gonna get tangled. I have about a 70-30 ratio of tangled to reeling in. I literally, this time, used an entire pack of Eagle Claw size 10 hooks because I tangled so many times in that place. But you know what, even with the broken rods and skin knees and wet boots and all the tangles and all the snags, this is an incredible place to go. It's gorgeous, it's dynamic, it's full of life, and I love to think about the well-worn paths that you see people go down. There's a tradition, and it's kind of just, you just know this. When you see someone you don't know coming out of the stream to the road, there's one question. Did you catch anything? And that's the word, yeah, I caught this. And then as they go, you quickly sneak down and try to get in that place right where they were at. But I love this place, and I believe that this section of water that bursts out of a reservoir and that cascades down the mountain with a dynamic, different terrain that is full of life and that moves into the pool that is Charles Lake, I think it's a perfect illustration and picture of the charismatic stream. Because the charismatic stream has been one that has been moving and rushing with dynamics and full of life. Not since the 1960s, not since the, the, the 1900s as Azusa Street, but goes way back. And this is a stream of individuals who say, you know what, I wanna be open to and receive the work of the Spirit and have the fruit, the gifts, the presence, the power of the Spirit of God move in my life. And so here's a definition that I wanna to use today for the charismatic stream. Charismatic stream, a spirit-filled life. A movement emphasizing and experiencing the gifts, fruits, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and the lives of the followers of Jesus. Emphasizing and experiencing the presence, the power, the fruits, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and in the lives of the followers of Jesus. People that are open to and have this passion and have this conviction to say, I believe that God has moved, is moving, and will be moving through his Holy Spirit. That this isn't something from long ago, but this is something for today. Just like going to 11 Mile Canyon and being on the shores of the South Platte, the charismatic stream is the stream that I grew up in. I didn't know we were charismatic. It wasn't like, you know, at a young age, you go, son, it's about time you know something about us. We're charismatics. Tell me it's not true, Dad. <laughs> No, I didn't know. All I knew is that our, the faith in which I inherited from my parents and that became mine was one in which God's kingdom and God's presence, his power, his truth, and his love through Jesus was something that was to be happening in our lives now. And so I remember as a little kid sitting at the top of the stairs when I was supposed to be in bed and I would sneak out when my parents would have friends over and they would have their missionary friends or their pastor friends or seminary students over and I would sit at the top of the stairs and I would listen and they would talk about signs and wonders and things that God was doing. I remember hearing stories from African missionaries about deliverance or miracles or healing and as I sat at the top of the stairs going, that's awesome. I don't know if I'm stoked or terrified but from the sounds of what they're saying, this God we're talking about in Sunday school is still alive. 
And so it was at the top of the stairs, or fast forward that when I was a preteen and we would have prayer meetings at the seminary, and I would have to watch the kids, and it was supposed to go from 7 to 8.30, but it always went to 10 because the spirit broke out, and which meant I had to stay later and watch these kids. I thought it was an excuse for just not following the rules. Well, the spirit broke out, and there would be prayer time, and there would be people, and they're coming out with their, you know, makeup is messed up, but they would have this joy on their face because they had experienced God. And all I wanted to experience was to go home. Or at my house where we had dinner parties, but, you know, when I was a kid and go to bed, they seemed different than the other kids' dinner parties because I remember they'd say, you know, it's time to go to bed or go watch a movie because we're going to pray for this person. Little did I know that there would be deliverance sessions in our living room. I say to my friends, do you have deliverance sessions in your living room? I don't know. And once again, I don't know whether to be absolutely excited or terrified. I just remember saying to the Lord, don't get any on me. Whatever's leaving that person, make sure it doesn't come in my door. I remember as a little kid just be like, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Putting the blood on my door. I don't even know what a pleading the blood is, but I'm pleading the blood. Jesus' name. It was just like, don't come in here. Or whenever we were a little older and I was about 19 years old, and after my first semester in college, I came home and we went on a trip. Maybe I was a little younger. I can't remember this, whether or not. Um, but we went on this trip and we went to Toronto, Canada to visit the Airport Vineyard Revival. There were revival services there and the Spirit of God had broken out in this place, and people were experiencing God. They were being changed. They were, they were being, having uh, gifts of the Spirit. There would be manifestations. And I remember going, and we entered into this big warehouse, and they were playing the song I'll never forget. Don't let my love, uh, it was light the fire again. Don't let my love grow cold. And I remember the line, wretched and blind I come. And just thinking, wow, this is just an interesting place. And so we go in there, and the worship is vibrant, and people are excited, and my grandmother is with us. Now, she is in her late 70s at the time. And my, she goes, and we line up, because they would have these lines where they would put tape on the ground, and if you would like to go receive prayer, you would go stand on the tape on the ground, and people would line up. And I remember standing by my grandmother as someone comes and prays for her, and she falls over, overwhelmed in the spirit, and is laying there with a smile on her face in this incredible, like, the love of God was shining on her. And I remember looking down at her and saying, I know this is real because that woman would never mess up her hair. <laughs> she would spend every week going to the sacred ritual of going to the beauty parlor and getting her perm just perfectly quaffed. And I remember watching her lay on the ground flat on her hair and going, that must be God. Because that woman wouldn't mess up that perm for anything. And then we headed back to Redding, California, and some of those same experiences of the touch of God in subtle ways from someone just speaking a scripture at the right moment, or someone speaking in tongues or interpretation, or someone laughing, or someone falling over in the spirit. But I remember going to these meetings as a 19-year-old, and we would have these meetings six days a week. And I remember going, this must be God, because I haven't been to church six times in the last year, and I don't want to miss a service. And me and my friends, who were all around the same age, we would gather together and we would go to these services where my dad was leading them, and there would be worship, and there'd be a message, and then there would be ministry time. And I just remembering it being like this beautiful downpour of the Spirit of God. And I remember watching this, and something in me was happening, and it was changing the course of my life. It was softening, and it was moving. And I remember how beautiful this was to be like, Lord, I want to wade in the waters of this stream, that you are moving, and that you are active, and that you are alive, and that your Holy Spirit is raining down and filling up. I could spend all day, and last service I spent way too much time telling too many stories about myself and these experiences, but it's been profound. But I want to shift gears, and I want us to back up, and I want us to go to a hike. I want us to go on an adventure, and I want us to head to the headwaters of the charismatic stream. 
I want us to go back upstream to the reservoir. And so we turn to the scriptures and we turn to Jesus. And we know that Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, that he was raised again by the Holy Spirit and that he released the Spirit to his followers. And Jesus said this in John chapter 7, 37 through 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those believed in him were to receive. For as yet they had not been given, the spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not glorified. And so Jesus stands, as we go to the headwaters of the charismatic stream, the spirit-filled life, we go to John's gospel, chapter seven, and Jesus stands up on the last day of the great feast. Do you know what the last day of the great feast was? Sukkot. The last day of Sukkot. Do you know what today is? The last day of Sukkot. And so 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago today, the headwaters of the charismatic stream, and let's take that term away, the, the charismatic stream. The headwaters of the spirit-filled life burst forth from the reservoir. And Jesus said to everyone that was gathered, he said, hey, you guys thirsty? Are you thirsty for more? Do you wanna experience something so much that it fills you up and flows out? And he says, come to me and drink deeply and I'll cause streams of living water to flow from your life. And I love that. What he's saying is, I'm gonna fill you up so much with my spirit that it's gonna bubble out. So we see the beginning of the headwaters of the spirit-filled life. Fast forward, Jesus in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter one, Jesus is gathering his disciples, he's been glorified, and he's about to send the promised gift of the, whole, of the Holy Spirit, the promise the Father had, had the, gift, the, promise, the, the gift the Father had promised. And it says in Acts 4, 8, while he was standing with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so Jesus says, hey, remember when I was talking about that water? It's about to happen, friends. And they say, is this the time you're gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? And he goes, no, that's not what we're talking about. I'm not talking about what I did then, I'm gonna talk about what I'm gonna do now. And he says, stay here and you will receive my spirit and power and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then they wait in the upper room. And they're gathered there and they're praying in Acts 2. I can only imagine those early followers. I wonder what, how they thought the Spirit was going to show up. If they'd have conversations. Well, Peter, how do you think he's going to show up? Well, I'm not quite sure, Thaddeus. But you haven't been mentioned much in the Bible, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but they're there in the upper room. And all of a sudden, the way the Spirit had showed up before was in the gentle presence of a dove. This time, not so much. The Spirit busts in like a hurricane. And there is the sound of a rushing wind. And he breaks open and he begins to fill the place with such a roar. And then there begins to be what looks like tongues of fire on people's head. He lights them up. He's like, boom. Everybody's got a tongue of fire on their head. They begin to get filled with the spirit. And they begin to speak in languages they never knew. And the people around them were from the foreign countries began to say, oh my word, this must be from God. But at that moment, the headwaters that Jesus promised, the reservoir broke and said, if you're thirsty, come to the stream and drink. And the headwaters broke forth and we see the beginning that this rushing movement of the Holy Spirit begins to move in the life of the people and it begins to fill them and empower them. This promised gift of the Father begins to fill them and begins to empower them, begins to give them gifts, begins to bear fruit and there are signs and there are wonders right there. 
The Apostle Paul had had his own experiences with the Holy Spirit later. He has this collision with Jesus. He falls off. Later on, he has an invasion of the Holy Spirit. Scales fall off his eyes. And he knows the importance of the Holy Spirit's presence and infilling in the life of the followers of Jesus. And so he says in 1 Corinthians, he's speaking to the church of Corinth. And I love that Corinth is a hot mess. They They just are. It's just like 11 Mile Canyon. There are broken rods and skin knees and wet boots and tangles all over the place. But the Apostle Paul speaks and he says in 1 Corinthians 12, now concerning spiritual gifts. Brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. I know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are various gifts, but the same spirit. There are various services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To one is given through a spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. And to another, faith, the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by one spirit. To another, the works of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. The apostle Paul is saying the stream, the river is flowing. I don't want you to be uninformed on how to navigate its waters. Because the spirit that flows from Jesus fills the life of the believer. It empowers the life of the believer. It gifts the life of the believer. It causes the ability to bear fruit in the life of the believer. And sometimes the spirit descends upon and sometimes the spirit wells up inside. And he wants that for everyone. And I believe he even echoes to us today to say, hey, Cornerstone, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual things. I want you to know that this is for you and this is for me. As we talk about this stream, the charismatic stream and the headwaters, there's been much debate. And as people look back at history, they, many brilliant individuals have said You know what? The outpouring and the infilling of the the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the gifts and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the life of the believer, that those demonstrations of that, that was only for the apostolic age. What they were meaning, that was only to happen in the beginning to get things started. Like it was the inertia to push it on. But after that, it wasn't. And so the death of the last apostles meant that the spirit didn't move anymore. There's one problem with that. As we look to history, no one told the Holy Spirit he was supposed to stop after the apostles died. And no one told the early church fathers and mothers not to write down what they saw the Spirit was doing. Because as we go to look at history and we move from the headwaters that are in Scripture, we move to the beginnings of the stream, we see that there are well-worn paths all along history. And so let's put those up there. You see that there is this, and this is just a very few of them. There is a fun study to look and to see how many individuals experienced the gifts of the Spirit and the presence and the power of the Spirit that it didn't stop when the apostles died. That it continued from the teachings of Jesus and the outpouring of Pentecost that like a rushing stream, it continued to move dynamically and full of life. And there are these well-worn paths. Justin Martyr, who lived from 100 to 165, he said, for the prophetical gifts remain with us even to the present day. Irenaeus He talked about the gifts of the Spirit and the presence of the Spirit in the life of the early followers. Origen said these things. There are still preserved among Christians traces of that Holy Spirit which appeared in the form of a dove. They expel spirits and perform many cures and foresee certain events according to the will of the Lagos. I love that. 
that in the second and third century, he writes to say, hey, there's evidence that this spirit that was supposed to have stopped, he's still moving. He's still doing things. Novotian, surreal of Jerusalem. But we move to Augustine. And we see that Augustine, who's just a giant of a theologian in the, in the Christian tradition, who's just written so many things and he has shaped much of the thinking of Western Christian spirituality. And in the beginning of his life, he fell in line to say, you know what? This stuff of the Spirit, this presence, power, fruits, and gifts of the Spirit, yeah, that stopped with the apostles. That was just for them. But as he grew and became an old man, he saw the un deniable evidence that God was still moving. And he writes in his famous book, The City of God, in 22, he says, once I realized how many miracles were occurring in our day, for it has only been two years ago that I kept a record that has happened here in Hippo, and already at this writing we have seen nearly 70 attested miracles. And so as he became an old man, he goes, you know what? My bad. That spirit that Jesus talks about flowing like streams of living water, that spirit that broke through at Pentecost, that spirit that Paul talks about, that spirit that is bursting out of the reservoir, it's running and it's moving today. And this is deep into the, to the fourth century, into the fifth century. And we see that the spirit of God is still moving. I'm gonna share just a couple more. We move into the life of John Wesley, and we move into the 1700s, and we see that there are these powerful movements of the Spirit of God. John Wesley, who was a professional preacher, but many times had doubt of his own faith in Jesus. And there was an experience where he went to a service where a Moravian preacher was preaching on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, and his brother Charles was working the communion table. And Charles was sick with a, with a a, a, a virus of his lungs, and as he was there, and as he heard of the movement of the Spirit, Charles becomes healed instantly in his belief, and he began filled with the Spirit. Three days later, John goes to a service reluctantly, and there in the service, the Spirit of God comes upon him, and he begins to experience the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, the wind of God, and it says, that his heart is strangely warm, physically warmed. And from that point on, John becomes a conduit of the stream of the Spirit. And he leads a revival in which many and many, many individuals experience the presence of Jesus and they experience the Holy Spirit and they are moved to faith in Jesus. Fast forwarding. We move into the early 1900s, and there's a man named William J. Seymour. And William J. Seymour is an African-American man. He's born in the late 1800s, and he is born to freed slaves in Louisiana. He's born into poverty. He's born into an incredibly uh, violent a tense environment due to race, but he has this passion for God and he goes to a variety of places and there he hears the message of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And he talks to someone and he says, how can I get more of this? And they say, you need to head to Texas and there is a man there that you need to study. And so he heads down to Texas and he's gonna get his first educational experience because he wants to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus, someone who empowers people in the Holy Spirit and they say, that's great, there's only one problem. You're black and you're not allowed in our building. And so they say, but you know what? Here's what we'll do. We'll leave the window open and the door open. And you can sit outside and you can listen. And this man who is filled with dignity and passion for God, I mean, the struggle must be just incredible to say this is absolutely unfair. But he wants what those people have so much did I mention that the charismatic movement has a lot of tangles? Yeah, that's one right there. The racism. But we move back. 
And William J. Seymour sits outside and he listens to the teaching and he says, this is what I want. And he absorbs the teaching about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And from that place, as a young man, he heads to L.A., to downtown L.A. And armed with a sermon, he gets invited to speak. And just like every young preacher, he gives it his all. And he comes in with guns ablazing about tongues and the Spirit of God. And the people there are so terrified that they literally kick him out and lock the door. But it doesn't stop him. So people invite him and he goes into a prayer meeting. And he starts a prayer meeting in his house. And there in the prayer meeting, the Lord begins to descend. And the Holy Spirit begins to meet him and meet the people. And there begin to be manifestation of the, of the gifts of the Spirit. There begins to be more of a fervency for Jesus. And that meeting begins to grow and grow and grow. And finally, they get some money and they head to a little church that had been dilapidated on a street called Azusa Street. And there they went into a rundown building that was 40 by 60 feet. And this building was, church had left a long time ago. And there were some merchants there. And one of the things that they were selling is they were selling tombstones. And so there's a tombstone dealer in the place of a birth of revival. Isn't that amazing? God has such a great sense of humor. I'm going to infuse life into my church out of a place that sells tombstones. And so William Seymour goes there, and William James Seymour, and he begins to preach, and he preaches about the outpouring of the Spirit. He preaches about a baptism of the Spirit. And people from all over the world begin to come to this place. And he has services three times a day, seven days a week. He's going for it. Morning, afternoon, and evening. And people from all over come, and a newspaper article writes about it because they're not only amazed at the fanatical experience, they're amazed that whites and blacks and different social classes and men and women and young and old and people from all over the world are coming together. This was an amazing phenomenon. Because in a really racial, ch racially charged environment that had a bifurcation of not only races but social classes, they're all gathering together, standing shoulder and shoulder and worshiping God and experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit. And people from all over the world begin to come to this. And they begin to experience it. And then they, they, they experience it. And then they take it back to their churches. And you have the beginning of the Pentecostal movement. Friends, I got a lot more characters and not a lot more time. And so I'll post those on the, the app. But I do want to look for a moment at these modern movements. Let's go to that screen if we could. Maybe. There we go. One of the things that happens in the 20th century and I just want to touch on this real quick, is there are three major movements, the beginning one of the Pentecostal movement with William J. Seymour. And it had this belief that came out of the holiness movement that there was a second work of grace, which was the baptism. There was a first conversion into life of Jesus, and then there was a second work, which would be a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And tongues was an evidence of this. If you spoke in tongues, you had had the baptism. They also believed that believers received all of the spiritual gifts. And so it was like kind of a utility belt of God. You're like, you need prophecy? Phew, gotcha. You need this? Phew, gotcha. You have all of them, any individual. Well, the Charismatics, which comes out of the 1960s, which is an amazing movement of the Charismatic Catholics that started at Duquesne University and continues on today, that there is a second work of grace. They believe in that, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Tongues is evidence, but they believe that there is a distribution of gifts. It means that in a group this size, all the gifts are apparent, but everybody doesn't have all the gifts. With John Wimber and some of his associates coming out of the 1970s and 80s, the third wave or the kingdom theology, they believe that you receive the Spirit at the moment you receive Jesus. So when you receive Jesus, you receive the Spirit. And tongues is not an exclusive evidence of that, but any of the gifts are. And more than that, the fruits are evidence of that. They believe in the distribution of spiritual gifts throughout the church, like the charismatics do. And they also have a dynamic of the now and not yet. And what they believed is, you know what? We believe that we experience 
the kingdom of heaven now, but not fully as it will be. And so there is this dynamic of the now and the not yet. I have given you a lot of theology and history. And for many of us, that can seem dry. But I have a question for you. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty today? Are you thirsty to drink deeply of the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you coming today and say, you know what? I want that in my life. I think that it is no coincidence, and I wish that Brian and Gene and I were so smart to say, we're gonna preach this sermon on the last day of Sukkot, but we, none of us realized it. It was a happy accident. But I believe that it isn't an accident. But I believe that there is something today for us to begin to hear the words that Jesus said over 2,000 years ago for us to not be afraid of the charismatic stream, to not be overly emphasizing and excited about the charismatic stream, but to simply say, I am thirsty. And for us to come to Jesus and to allow him to fill us and continually fill us with his Holy Spirit. So in a moment, what I'm gonna invite you, as the band comes up, and as we're gonna be just a little bit late today, what I invite you to do is we're gonna bring the prayer team up. And if you're in this place and you're saying, you know what? I wanna drink deeply of the waters that broke forth from that reservoir that Jesus talked about. I wanna drink deeply from those waters that came at Pentecost and that Paul helps navigate. I wanna drink deeply from those waters that people for centuries have been walking down well-worn paths to be at. I wanna invite you today to come and receive prayer. For some of you, it may be, you know, for the first time, and some of you may be for the hundredth time. So if the prayer team would come on down, that'd be great. You know, for some of us, we have heard of the misuses and the abuses of the charismatic stream, the emotionalism, the, fanat you know, the, 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 the phenomenal things that everybody focuses on, and that's been a deterrent. But what I'd like to do today is that we look to Jesus, and we say, Jesus, I want the Holy Spirit that you are talking about. And oftentimes we wonder, how do we navigate this? And I think it's really simple. When we look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 through 20, there is this beautiful map to the waters of the Spirit. And the Apostle Paul says, don't quench the Spirit's fire. Don't rebuke prophecies. Test everything. Hang on to what is good. And flee from evil. And so friends, for us at Cornerstone, as a community, that's how we navigate the charismatic stream. We don't want to quench the Spirit's fire, the movement of the Spirit. We don't want to rebuke prophecies, but we want to test everything to Jesus, test everything to the Word. We want to hang on to what is good and flee from evil. And so if you are thirsty today for a deeper drink of the Spirit of God, would you come for some prayer? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come and do all the things you want to do. Jesus, Messiah, I am thirsty and I want to come to you and drink deeply of your Holy Spirit. That streams of living water would flow in and through my life. I join with the prophet Habakkuk. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. And in our time, make them known. Your kingdom come and your will be done.